Hello everyone and welcome back to English 1110. I am back for another video lecture. As a reminder, this is your video lecture two of three because you got three for this week because we just simply have a lot to do. So because we have a lot to do, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it. I have a lot to say for this content-based lecture for this week seven of English 1110 and I hope that you have enjoyed, been engaged with, I don't know what the right verb would be here to describe what I hope was your takeaway with the Miley Cyrus music videos and Black Mirror episode that you've watched before watching this lecture. But pause, if you haven't done that work, don't watch this lecture, go do that work first and then come back to me and then we will talk about things, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that we can dive into all of this Miley Cyrus content. All right, of course it has taken a moment to load, it is thinking, all right, there we go. So what I have for you today is you get the best of both worlds, the pop star commodity and the house of mouse. Again, this is Miley Cyrus week, um, which is just kind of my way of synthesizing that our primary text for the week is Miley Cyrus, um, the star, the celebrity, the person. Um, but our way into talking about her is going to be, of course, through the music videos and the Black Mirror episode that you watched leading up to this lecture, okay? Um, and so, of course, Miley Cyrus is going to offer us quite a few different pathways through thinking about not only her individual career, but also what it means to be a Disney star, and also kind of how life imitates art, but also sometimes how art presents a really interesting layered version of an individual um, that is pressurized in some respects by um, brands and corporations and fans and isn't necessarily just the possession of the individual person themselves, okay? So this lecture at a glance, as always, this is hyperlinked for you so you can move throughout the slides hopefully a bit easier than having to click all the time. But our sections for today are classic Hollywood cinema, the rise of Walt Disney and the Walt Disney Company, the Hannah Montana brand, and key concepts to remember. So as a reminder, this is the content lecture for this week, which means that I will be talking through what you watched for the day and focusing on Miley Cyrus as our primary source, whereas the next lecture after this is concentrated on writing strategies. All right. So there are two lecture highlights that I really want to make sure that you take note of, literally and figuratively. Um, and so the first lecture highlight reads, the Disney pop star is a commodity created by the Disney Corporation. The star has limited rights within this relationship due to morality clauses and corporate control of their image. The pop star commodity is presented to audiences in a particular way that aligns with a larger corporate vision. This presentation permanently informs how the star is read by the viewing public, even after this contract expires, ends, and after the star leaves the studio or corporation. So we're going to dive into thinking about the commodification of young stars, especially the fact that the Disney pop star generally is a girl. Um, we, of course, have some exceptions to that, like the Jonas Brothers, but a lot of times we are thinking specifically about a girl pop star. Right, who's kind of holding up the corporation's wants, wishes, needs um, through their creative labor of performing. Now, one of the things we want to be really attentive to is how this star has very limited rights within the scope of this relationship. Um, this should hopefully take us back to thinking about uh, Shoshana Zuboff's surveillance capitalism in that for, you know, kind of the responses that y'all wrote in your process post, I kind of nudged a couple of you to think a little bit more about, you know, when we're thinking about a relationship between, you know, an entity like Google and the individual internet user, there's a relationship there, of course, through the fact that the individual internet user is using Google, um, but is that relationship balanced? Are the power balances equal? Are they in favor of the individual or are they skewed in favor of the corporation and larger entity, right? These are things we have to be thinking about especially as we're thinking about, you know, incentives, motives, and circumstances that really create or prompt certain decision-making from us as individuals or at a larger scale from a star or celebrity, okay? Now, what's tricky here is that you also have the layer of fans and viewers and audience members who are witnessing and observing what the star is doing and, you know, developing their own opinions um, and creating their own decision-making as a result of it. And so we wanna really be thinking about these three different layers of the corporation, 
the pop star and the fans and remembering that the pop star is trying to appeal to the fans because the corporation wants them to do so, but also because the star typically wants to maintain their fame and success. So let's dive into this first section of classic Hollywood cinema. And you might be thinking, why what the heck do we need to start here? Um, well, it's because we want to really make sure that we are thinking about context and we're thinking about the fact that Disney doesn't exist in a vacuum, okay? So classic Hollywood is a term you may or may not have heard um, when thinking about or talking about U.S. popular culture. And classical Hollywood or classic Hollywood, either one is fine, um, but classical Hollywood cinema stretches from the late 1920s to the early 1960s. So you have this kind of 40 year period, um, give or take, right, that is really kind of identifiable as this classic Hollywood moment, if you will. Now, this term was coined by David Bordwell, Janet Steger, and Kristen Thompson in 1987. And with it, they argue that films during this period have a clear beginning, middle, and end. And as well, they really focus on the cause and effect of things, okay? That's how the narrative is constructed. Now, a few of the critical details they focus on are editing techniques, narrative storytelling, and how a film communicates the time and location of the story. Now, with this, we also have the term the golden age, and this is a really important um, kind of point in thinking about film history and U.S. popular culture history that it's really helpful to be familiar with. Now, the silent film era, which we talked about a tiny bit when we were talking about vocalizing and visualizing dissent, in that we kind of talked about it, you know, interwoven with our discussions of blackface and kind of uh, cinema lighting. But the silent film era lasted from the late 1890s until the 1920s. So if you recall, I mentioned that typically when somebody would go to kind of a picture house, um, you know, particularly in this silent film era, what they would do is they would go inside, and there'd be somebody playing the organ as they watch the film on screen and the intertitles that would appear between different scenes would help to deliver the dialogue and kind of clarify what was happening. Um, of course, the audience members would see the performer's mouths moving and they'd see their kind of physical behavior, but they couldn't hear their voices, right? And so in 1927, we get our first sound film, The Jazz Singer, which if you recall, um, was one that I mentioned in the Vocalizing and Visualizing Dissent Lecture, because that was the film that I mentioned where Al Jolson performs in blackface um, at one point in the film. Now, because this film was the first sound film, um, at times, some film scholars attempt to downplay the significance and problems of Al Jolson performing in blackface in this film. But we want to remember that we can kind of hold two things at the same time, right? Um, the Jazz Singer is a film that is important to film history because of, you know, the fact that we have a sound film that features synchronized sound, meaning that we're hearing and seeing, you know, people talking at the same time. We're able to hear the music that people are performing on instruments in the film at the same time that we're also able to recognize that there are really racist problems with the persistence of blackface um, and minstrelsy performances by white performers, you know, throughout US popular culture history, but even as pronounced in this 1927 film. Now, some scholars argue that the term golden age is gonna be best applied to the 1929 to 1945 period, whereas others are gonna argue that it should be limited to describing the 1930s and 1940s. And I include this detail here just to show that there continues to be kind of discussion and debate over you know, when we talk about, um, you know, periods of, of history, especially film history, they're not as clear cut as maybe something like a war history where it's like, you know, this particular war starts approximately this time frame and ends approximately this time, right? Film is a little bit trickier sometimes to nail down in such precise terms. But what is important to remember is that the U.S. film industry was heavily intertwined with the war effort in World War II. And that film, while already important and influential since the 1890s in the U.S., became a key source of distraction, entertainment, and propaganda for audiences in the 20th century. Um, if we were in person, I would kind of go down the rabbit hole with you and we'd talk a little bit about how Disney was so intertwined with war, kind of World War II efforts. Um, and just kind of the persistence at which the U.S. government has really relied on film as a propaganda source to kind of, you know, deliver messages about patriotism, about military service, about a variety of different topics, including, unfortunately, xenophobia and racism as well. But for now, I just want to really emphasize that the reason that we're looking to film is because it is a consistently 
um, just significant and central way through which the government, but also corporations have delivered messages to the public at large about society, about what it means to be a person, right? And film can be really impactful as a medium for also normalizing, you know, oppressive structures, for normalizing um, just kind of racist and sexist and homophobic and ableist um, institutions, right? There's a lot of things that film can kind of enforce as much as it can also be a source of joyfulness and entertainment and distraction. I think we definitely also saw that as well in 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Entertainment really became quite obvious, I think, um, to naysayers who oftentimes kind of say like, well, what's the point of film and television? So many of us were relying on film and television as a distraction and escape, um, you know, during 2020. Now, some examples of films from the classical Hollywood cinema era include Snow White and the Seven Dwarves in 1937, which was the first Disney full-length feature animated film. We, of course, saw some little snippets of kind of Mickey um, animated features or kind of animated shorts, I should say, in the vocalizing and visualizing descent week. Um, but Snow White really emerges as the first Disney princess film and really emerges as the first feature length film that really catapults Disney into a kind of mainstream success and household um, kind of name territory. We've also got The Wizard of Oz in 1939, which is a film that starts out in black and white and gradually moves to Technicolor and then returns to black and white by the end. We also have Sunset Boulevard in 1950, um, which is a really interesting text in which a real former life, uh, or a real former silent film star <laughs> um, actually kind of portrays a silent film star in the film unable to just kind of um, grapple with the transitions that happened to the industry when the film industry did transition from silent to talkies. Um, and kind of the term talkie was a way of signifying or signaling films that did in fact have kind of, you know, actors needing to talk to be able to deliver their lines and not relying on kind of the organ player and the intertitles to do that part of the work. Now, what's interesting also about Sunset Boulevard, but also kind of its, you know, focus on silent film stars is that many silent film stars were not able to successfully make the transition from silent film to talkies because they were so accustomed to acting in a particular way, physically and just facially, um, that that didn't necessarily translate properly into a version of film where they had to be talking and everything was synchronized, right? Um, so it's a very interesting moment where Hollywood kind of abruptly shifts and many folks unfortunately get left behind. And then Singing in the Rain from 1952 um, is another classic, classic film. Um, we definitely see kind of the rise of the musical in this period, um, especially for female stars being a dancer, singer, actress, and kind of this triple threat person becomes a really important way through which one can become a star as opposed to just an actor or performer. Other examples also include Shall We Dance from 1937, which features the iconic pair of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, who of course become super well known for their just dynamic dance routines and ability to just perform amazing numbers. We also have All About Eve in 1950 and His Girl Friday in 1940, both of which feature um, really well-known female stars like Betty Davis and Rosalind Russell. And we, of course, also have kind of Cary Grant as one of the more famous male stars as well. Now, in thinking about kind of what I mentioned earlier about film also delivering kind of propaganda on behalf of the U.S. government, unfortunately, around this period, we also have um, World War II propaganda films that push stereotypes about Japanese and German people. Um, Der Fuhrer's Face in 1943, Japetours in 1942, and Education for Death in 1942 were um, films that, you know, were animated. They were in Technicolor. Some were Disney, some were Max Fleischer. Um, but all of these kinds of films, their purpose was to ensure that the viewing public in the United States who watched these films would take on very stereotypical, limited, xenophobic in kind of views about folks in other countries, specifically folks in other countries that the U.S. was at war with, right? Um, and this unfortunately continues to be true in some cases, that when the kind of U.S. films portray spaces other than the U.S., such as like Mexico or Cuba 
or Argentina or, you know, Africa, right? Um, it could be a whole continent, it could be a singular country, it could be a region, right? The point here being that U.S. film oftentimes kind of groups together people in very limited and stereotypical ways. Um, and when we think about the significance of animation style, right, we want to be really attentive to the fact that oftentimes, much like the Jay-Z music video that we looked at, um, animation can also kind of facilitate some of the stereotyping by enlarging and exaggerating certain features on certain bodies um, and really kind of just distributing really harmful images that can translate into real world violence against and discrimination against um, various different people, especially depending on kind of who's deemed villainous or who's deemed the enemy in a US context, okay? Now, as I've already kind of started to preview, what becomes so important about kind of the golden age of Hollywood, but also just kind of classical Hollywood cinema is that it really provides a springboard through which female stars become to really um, just show up in the foreground of pop culture. In the 1930s and 40s, we have stars like Katherine Hepburn, Joan Crawford, and Vivian Lee. We also have Lucille Ball, Ginger Rogers, and Rita Hayworth. I wanna also flag too, that when we think about kind of female stars, largely they were white women, though occasionally you had sort of non-white women who were also able to move into the star category, so long as they were fair-skinned or white passing and were able to kind of manipulate their features through makeup or wardrobe or hair um, or occasionally cosmetic procedure to look more white um, so that an audience would not pick up on the facts that the fact that they're perhaps mixed or not white at all. In the 1940s and 1950s, we have Grace Kelly, Marilyn Monroe, and Elizabeth Taylor. In the 1950s and 1960s, we have Shirley MacLaine, Sophia Loren, and Bridget Bardot. Bridget Bardot, of course, having super iconic hair. 1950s and 60s, we've got Debbie Reynolds, Audrey Hepburn, Kim Novak, right? And I also want to just kind of flag if it wasn't already kind of um, just subtly implied that all of these women were typically exceptionally thin um, or, you know, kind of just in general, you would see kind of the diversity would be a range of either blonde or brunette. Um, and many of these films would kind of feature conflicts in which the brunette was evil and the blonde was pure or the good girl. And that was kind of as far as they got in terms of showing um, diversity in women. Now, the star system of Hollywood, which is of particular interest to us as we start talking about Miley Cyrus, was in effect from the late 1920s to the early 1960s. And in the star system, major studios made movie stars out of actors and actresses and remade them with new names, new backstories, new skills, and new looks. In doing so, studios could then create and control the stars that were in their films. However, this control benefited the studio and ultimately harmed the well-being of the actor or actress. So, for example, I included a little um, graphic here that kind of includes some different examples of the more kind of well-known cases of the star system <laughs> remaking an actor or actress over. Um, so, for example, we have like Norma Mortensen who gets remade over into Marilyn Monroe. Um, we have kind of Bernard Schwartz being remade over into Tony Curtis, Alexander Zuck being remade to Sandra D, so on and so forth, right? And so this makeover process wasn't just a matter of changing their name, but also in a lot of cases, it was also changing their style, changing their bodies, putting them on diet regimens, putting them on exercise regimens, really taking control of the entirety of the human person and making sure that when they were presented to the public, their hair looked a particular way, it was dyed a particular color. Um, Marilyn Monroe, there's like various kind of discussions about kind of how her hairline was altered and just kind of um, consistently across, especially female performers, there was a lot of investment from the corporations um, or kind of studios in wanting to ensure that the star that they were quote unquote investing in was going to look, behave, and be the way that they wanted them to be on screen and off. Now, regulating morality in Hollywood is something that, you know, really kind of came to a head at this point in time, but continues to be an issue now, and especially is of kind of importance to our discussions about Disney. 
Now, the production code was instituted in 1930 and remained in effect in Hollywood until 1968. And this code was created and enforced by studio executives to control how much obscenity, sexual content, and violence was shown in feature films. Relatedly, morality clauses were created in 1922 by Will H. Hayes, and these statements you know, appeared in contracts issued by studios to stars and required the star to abide by specific behavioral expectations in order to keep their job. You now, Gloria Swanson and Jean Harlow are two examples of female stars who really just kind of went through the ringer um, with these morality clauses and just kind of um, this production code. But some of the examples we can think of, of here is the fact that, you know, female stars were told when and if they could get pregnant, when and if they could get married, um, who they were allowed to be married to, what movies they were or were not allowed to be part of, um, what studios they could or could not work for. Again, they were put on diet regimens. They were, you know, made to exercise and only kind of um, exist outside of performing only so much of the time. Um, and their look was very much controlled by these studios that decided kind of on what terms they were visible to the public. Now I've included for you here, I always forget to change this inconsistency here of like Vanity Fair and Harper's Bazaar. I apologize, it's a thing. Um, <laughs> a few of these slides that I've reused with the same screenshots and, and such, I forget to, to edit for the same errors I see all the time, oh, classic. Anyways, um, I do encourage you to review this link to learn more about some of the rules that stars had to abide by. I have provided a few screenshots here to give you some examples, just in case you're somebody who does not take my advice and look at these supplemental materials. So one of which was women often had to change things. Their appearances, um, their love lives were often arranged and diets were often restricted. Some of which, of course, I have just briefly recapped for you right now. So let's go ahead and move to our next section, which is the rise of Walt Disney and the Walt Disney Company. So some of the kind of ways in which we think about Disney in the contemporary moment, of course, is through the animated films that come out in this period of time, especially princess films um, and kind of anthropomorphized animal films where you have characters that are sort of um, you know, kind of on this quest to find love or to be reunited with someone or something or in pursuit of something, right? Um, oftentimes, these are films that are kind of presented as universal tales, meaning that anyone would be able to relate to them. So examples of these kinds of films that came out at this time were Bambi in 1940, Cinderella in 1950, and Sleeping Beauty in 1959. Um, and of course, there are more films than these that came out, but I do want to really signal that although Snow White performed really successfully for the Walt Disney, um, just kind of studio and the, you know, the guy himself, um, he, you know, proceeds to experience a lot of up and downs financially, and also just some films were hits, some films were not, and of course, whereas today we have kind of a, um, total domination of Disney as a corporation, definitely during kind of the golden age of Hollywood, Disney was up and down in terms of reputation and in terms of just financial status. Now I skipped here a little bit because we just don't simply have enough time to talk about everything, but Disneyland is a theme park in Anaheim, California that opens on Sunday, July 17th, 1955. Of course, is kind of the dream and vision of Walt Disney himself. And its second day grand opening took place on Monday, July 18th from uh, 1955. And one of the things that was really kind of significant about this grand opening is that a 90 minute special titled Dateline Disneyland aired on TV to promote the park to those who had not attended the grand opening. And 90 million people watched the grand opening on television. And so this choice to kind of make visible the park opening to folks all over the place, not just folks who were kind of um, immediately in proximity to the park is really important because we start to see the Disney brand really prioritize television as a medium at this point in time. Now, I've obviously up until now been concentrating on film as kind of this really important landscape through which um, various messages are delivered, corporations and studios are really trying to kind of appeal to the um, viewer and the audience. 
But really in the 1950s and kind of from then on, we start to see the domination of television and more specifically television as something that starts to, you know, make way into suburban households um, and really also starts to replace radio as the previous method through which families would typically get their news and information and their entertainment. These are also kind of radio shows that weren't just, you know, talk shows, but were also kind of, um, you know, fictional adventure stories and so on. But with the premiering of this special on TV, Disneyland really experiences kind of this double dipping of sorts where it's like there's the physical landscape of Disneyland that's really attracting a lot of people to it. But then you also have people all over the place watching their televisions and Disneyland appearing in their living room and kind of having this moment of like really intense excitement and fascination with and connection with Disney as a brand. <clears throat> Now, kind of beyond this initial program, Walt Disney continues to sustain his connection with audiences through the television set um, with Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color. And this was an anthology television series that premiered from 1955 to 1991 and, you know, kind of aired under multiple different names. It was created by Walt Disney, produced by Walt Disney Productions, and aired on American Broadcasting Company, or ABC, which is presently owned by Disney. And it was first created so that Walt Disney could promote Disneyland attractions, as well as Disney Studios animations, features, and specials. So you can kind of think about it as a commercial, um, but a commercial that people really enjoyed because they got to see kind of the guy behind the brand. He oftentimes would kind of have Mickey Mouse or other characters have little appearances in the show. And so it felt really um, kind of family friendly, but also personal and felt like you were kind of befriending or getting to know or having this parasocial relationship with this visionary creator. Now, another program that gets delivered to audiences through the television set is the Mickey Mouse Club. And this was a variety television show that aired from 1955 to 1996. And the show initially existed to draw more attention to Disneyland, but eventually it became a launch pad for a new generation of stars who were known as the Mouseketeers. And each episode showed the Mouseketeers performing a variety of skills. Um, and so really it became a way through which kind of the teen and tween markets really started to find kind of, um, you know, people of their age that really felt iconic to them, right? And again, variety show, different talents that were exhibited. It was very much just like, look at all these cool kids who have these talents and they know Walt Disney and they're associated with the Disney brand, right? And so it becomes its own thing, independent of just doing more marketing for Disneyland. Now, some of the stars who come out of the 90s version of the Mouseketeers um, include Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Ryan Gosling, and Justin Timberlake. Um, they all go through this kind of Mouseketeer program. Um, I don't know what else to call it here, but you know, they start out here. They obviously all four continue to be very successful, though, of course, we have a very um, just kind of, I think, in this contemporary moment, a continually talked about breakup between Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake, great. Um, and I think attitudes towards Justin Timberlake have shifted quite a bit, um, even though initially it was Britney Spears that was kind of demonized um, and decided upon as, as evil. That's all I'll say. Then I'll go down the rabbit hole of Britney and, and Justin. <laughs> um, I've included here an episode of the Mickey Mouse Club from season one, and it's the Fun with Music Day roll call. You don't have to watch it, but you can watch it if you'd like to. Um, it can be helpful for context. As you'll notice, all of the different stars had their little shirts that had their name on it. They all wore Mickey Mouse ears. Um, good family, wholesome fun. That was really kind of the, the brand, okay? Now, to kind of move forward and skip a little bit, um, I wanted to include this graphic that it's definitely going to be best to look at um, on Google Slides, where you can kind of zoom in a little bit if you can put it in full screen. But um, in this contemporary period, Disney definitely owns and just like is affiliated with, but really owns um, quite a bit more than it did um, as a company kind of when it starts out at the um, you know, kind of early to mid 20th century. Um, some examples, of course, include that with that Walt Disney, sorry, if, you get, if you're getting the street noise, um, that Disney acquires a lot of different um, franchises and brands in addition to, you know, sustaining what they already had um, created or had in their possession. 
So this kind of breaks down on the right the various different entities that Disney owns. Um, I just want to flag here that Disney owns a combination of, you know, entertainment platforms, news platforms, sports platforms. Um, they really have kind of a transmedia approach, which means that they are really invested in narrative storytelling across mediums, whether that's television, film, comic books, picture books, you know, formal literature, et cetera, et cetera, right? But they also have a lot of kind of material culture parts as well, such as their theme parks, um, the plushies that they have, right? They do, a, a, I don't want to say billion, but they do a ton, let's say, of collaborations with brands related to makeup and food. I mean, like, I bought bananas the other day and it had a Disney sticker on it, right? Um, Disney is everywhere. And so my point here is that Disney's reach is far and wide, and they are very much close to being a monopoly in a lot of these respects, which means that they very much control any and everything, um, which poses a bit of a challenge, right? Because if we think about um, power differentials and just kind of balances of power, when a corporation owns this many things, um, even if we look at just even one of these categories, um, that can make it very challenging and intimidating for an individual person to perhaps stand up against a corporation, but also can make it really challenging for an individual person to get work elsewhere if the other options for employment are still owned by the same parent company, okay? Which brings us to the Disney Channel. Um, and so this is a TV channel that was created in 1983 and of course still remains on television. And it airs a variety of original television series, Disney Channel original movies or DCOMs and promos for only Disney content. Um, DCOM started airing in 1997 and continue to be released. Examples of course include The Cheetah Girls, High School Musical, Camp Rock, Descendants and Halloween Town. Um, and so Disney Channel really becomes a space through which they are able to very successfully kind of, um, I don't want to say just like control, but they're able to really, I guess, kind of dominate the conversation about kind of tween and teen lives and identities and so on and so forth, right? And so the, the thing here is that Disney Channel becomes kind of a launch pad through which Disney is able to kind of introduce stars really early on to viewers and then kind of build out their careers over time and really relies on them to sustain this channel, but also to just kind of make sure um, truthfully that just like, how do I put this? I mean, they're just trying to make sure that like <laughs> their audience stays in touch with them as you know long as they possibly can. Um, so let's kind of talk through the Hannah Montana brand. Um, what I'm actually going to do is because this lecture is so long, I'm actually going to go off camera at this point. Um, hope that's fine, but you'll still be able to obviously hear me. Um, so give me one second to kind of adjust that. Um, let's see. Okay. Alrighty. Perfect. So Hannah Montana brand. <clears throat> All right, so we get Hannah Montana, the television show from 2006 to 2011. And the show followed an average teenage girl named Riley Stewart, who was a regular high school student by day and the world's biggest pop star by night. I've included some promos for Hannah Montana on Disney Channel, specific to when it premiered in 2006, just so you can see some examples of how the show was, you know, kind of advertised to kids. Um, and specifically, it was being advertised really to um, kind of the tween audience, those who are not really children, not really teenagers, they were kind of the in-betweeners of, you know, um, 10, 11, and 12. And another promo for you here, I will move kind of quickly through some of these things to do my best to keep this lecture as quick as possible. So I also include a promo for Hannah Montana the movie from 2009, which of course was the great transition from having Hannah Montana on television to having a movie on the big screen. And now while this may seem kind of insignificant or irrelevant, the important thing here is that this really catapults Disney into kind of <clears throat> recognizing that there's money to be made from kind of having these, you know, various stars, um, you know, perform not only on the Disney Channel where it's kind of all Disney all the time, but that they could also get even more money if they really invested in these feature films. 
Now, what really kind of synthesizes the 2006 to 2009 era of Miley Cyrus's career is you get the best of both worlds, you get the best of both girls, which of course comes from the theme song to Hannah Montana. But by the time we get to 2009 to 2012, that mantra kind of shifts to I can't be tamed. Um, and if you think to that video in particular of Can't Be Tamed, you can really start to see signs that Miley Cyrus is trying to transition out of her Disney image and focus instead on really creating a Miley Cyrus brand that's not just limited to Disney. Now, if we look at her output in terms of discography from 2006 to 2010, when she was still signed to, you know, kind of Disney associated labels, we can see that she was definitely working a lot. Most notably in 2007, she releases a two disc special called Hannah Montana 2, Meet Miley Cyrus. And not only was this um, you know, album intended to be the follow-up to the 2006 Hannah Montana soundtrack, but it was also an opportunity for Miley Cyrus to begin releasing songs under her own name. And she really kind of um, alternates between Miley Cyrus branded songs and Hannah Montana branded songs until 2010 when she kind of formally starts to make her departure from Disney. However, as you can see here, the really kind of in thinking back to, um, you know, golden age of Hollywood, Miley Cyrus really carries with her in some respects, the kind of blonde versus brunette that we see in earlier films in that Hannah Montana is the blonde pop star and Miley Cyrus is the brunette everyday girl. And while they're not necessarily in conflict by way of, you know, kind of one is evil and one is good, we do see that the brunette is really struggling with, you know, wanting to be kind of liked for who she is and recognizing the blonde version of her as the one that's really got all of the adoring fans and just kind of, you know, all of the really intense success, which kind of carries over into Miley Cyrus's own experience as well. In 2011 to 2015, she releases two different projects, um, most notably Bangers in 2013, and then Miley Cyrus and her Dead Pets in 2015. What's important to kind of note here is that Bangers becomes really the, um, not the transition album that we see prior to this, but it becomes kind of the album that signals Miley Cyrus independent of Disney and her really trying to shatter her Disney image more formally. Miley Cyrus and Her Dead Pets was an independently released and free released project, which means that Miley Cyrus didn't work with a studio and she released it for free to everyone. Definitely sounds different than every other project that you'll see here. Um, you can find, I think some of the songs or even the full album on YouTube, um, but it's definitely a lot more warped and distorted than what we have elsewhere, even though Bangers kind of more formally um, you know, distorts the Hannah Montana image as we knew it up until that point. From 2016 to 2020, we get three albums, um, Younger Now in 2017, the EP She Is Coming in 2019, and then uh, Plastic Hearts in 2020, um, all of which definitely signal to us Miley Cyrus trying on very different looks throughout her career, both in terms of hair, in terms of silhouettes, but also in terms of sounds. She definitely moves through genres and looks um, quite fluidly, I would say, um, especially kind of in this latter half of the 2010s, and definitely does so to kind of, again, try to carve out a space for herself beyond Disney. And we can kind of see evidence of this, even when we look at how her kind of red carpet and public appearance looks, um, uh, kind of looked, you know, in 2006 and 2007, when Miley Cyrus was first emerging, where we can really see kind of, um, you know, classic awkwardly composed Disney outfits that were really kind of the, um, you know, kind of girly pop star, good girl next door type looks that Disney was investing in for her. But by 2008 to 2010, Miley Cyrus starts to really kind of shed that look. You can see that she dyes her hair black in 2008 um, while she's promoting Hannah Montana. Um, you can also see that she definitely kind of starts to favor more short skirts and short shorts for her kind of concerts and live appearances, um, which really moves away from kind of the long hems that we were getting up until this point. She's wearing a lot more leather. She's wearing a lot of kind of booty um, shoes at a lot of these moments in time and just really is opting for blacks, grays, and whites as her color palette of choice. We can also see that kind of the transition is, is super clear here in terms of other concert performance looks that we go from kind of these um, geometric looks earlier on to then kind of having an attempt at like a pop punk Avril Lavigne to eventually kind of landing on this like black leather and then kind of cut out mesh 
look that really dominates her kind of appearance um, up until her bangers era. Now we'll kind of come back to talking about Miley Cyrus in this section of key concepts to remember, because I do have to try to squish multiple lectures down into one lecture, but this is gonna kind of signal for you where we're moving into concepts that are gonna help us. So as a reminder, the US capitalism is an economic and political system in the United States that is for profit and based on competition in the market, wage labor and private ownership. The consumer is a person who purchases goods or services based on need or desire. And the commodity is an item that is produced by a corporation, business, or individual and is sold to a consumer. The commodity can fill a need or satisfy a desire. And I, of course, mentioned these previously, which is why I'm moving kind of quickly. Appropriation should also be a term that looks familiar to you as it is the intentional borrowing, copying, and alteration of existing images and objects. It is a strategy that has been used by artists for millennia. It took on new significance in the mid 20th century with the rise of consumerism and the proliferation of images through mass media outlets from magazines to television, which is of course an excerpt from the pop art article that you looked at. Now commodification is the process of treating someone or something as a commodity that is intended for someone else's consumption or use, which is ultimately for a larger entity's benefit. Now, commodification can happen on a micro level, meaning it can be one individual commodifying another, such as this example here, where a man creepily created a doll of Scarlett Johansson that was intended to look exactly like her. Um, and he tried to say that it was not for creepy reasons, but, you know, I'll just leave that there. Um, commodification can also be, you know, seen in examples such as this nylon Germany cover, where they kind of altered and used an image of Billie Eilish without her consent or just kind of, you know, permission whatsoever. And then we also see kind of a more clear cut example here with this Hannah Montana Barbie doll that also makes use of Miley Cyrus's face in this corner. Now, commodification is something that, you know, within capitalism makes sense that it would proliferate because if capitalism is all about the exchange of goods and services and kind of the desire of goods and services that can, you know, potentially bring joy or fulfillment or distract us from other things, um, we can see how the star really is at the forefront of that. So Norma Jean Mortensen, or Marilyn Monroe as we know her as, is an example of how a celebrity's image becomes commodified and lives on after death. I've included quite a few examples here, including of an Instagram of someone who dresses up in, as Marilyn Monroe in all of her pictures. We've got figurines, stickers, you know, pop art, pop art of course, um, a mug and pillows as all, but definitely not um, an exhaustive list of ways in which Marilyn Monroe has been commodified. Hannah Montana, similar thing, right? We've got Miley Cyrus's face all over the place on plenty of different projects, but we also see that Disney starts to really work her hard um, by not only kind of having her do feature films, but also by doing a best of both worlds concert where it's a live special in 3D in which in the theater you could go see Miley Cyrus performs both her Miley Stewart and Hannah Montana characters, um, which is kind of bananas, but it was a way in which kind of they could build up the, you know, the spectacle of like, isn't Miley and Hannah the same person? Whole thing, lots going on here. Um, Miley Cyrus was really working hard, right? We also see that her image shows up on such a variety of things, including um, sewing patterns for clothes, um, various fabrics on lip glosses and jewelry and, you know, guitar pick necklaces, right? Definitely just kind of the image of Miley Cyrus became the face of a ton of different material culture objects. Now, again, all of this is important because we have Miley Cyrus, the individual person, but we also have Miley Cyrus, the brand, who is connected to Hannah Montana, the brand, who is owned and connected to Disney, the brand, right? And so in the midst of all of this, it's really complicated, especially when Miley Cyrus's first name was also utilized for the kind of real girl version of Hannah Montana, Miley Stewart, which meant that the blending together of Miley, Hannah, and Miley um, was really hard to decipher and to kind of pull apart, especially in that early 2006 to 2009 period when Miley Cyrus was very much kind of the, um, just at the forefront of Disney Channel's brand. Now this brings us to this term distort and distortion, which again should look familiar because it means to twist something out of shape 
This could occur sonically, visually, physically, etc. And we talked about this before when we were thinking about distortion as a concept that could be helpful to apply. But I wanted to kind of re um, just kind of re-mention it here because it can be really helpful with thinking about how Miley Cyrus's own self sort of kind of sense of self was being distorted at this point. Now, xenophobia is also a term that can be helpful for this week, even though not exclusively with Miley Cyrus, but just in thinking with um, kind of Hollywood and film more broadly, if you recall, I mentioned that they can really deliver problematic and harmful, you know, messaging about various groups of people. And so xenophobia is the hatred of, dislike of, and we're prejudiced towards people from other countries, which unfortunately film and television can really perpetuate. Influence and influencer is also an important term. You, of course, might know this term specifically through the lens of social media influencer, but it can really be a person, entity, or organization's ability to determine or sway an individual's beliefs, sense of self, or interest. So it doesn't have to be exclusive to social media, though the contemporary dominant example, of course, would be that. Propaganda, which also kind of takes us back to our discussions of golden age of Hollywood, is going to be information and or messages distributed by an individual organization or government to promote a particular point of view to an audience that they believe it. Propaganda produces a very clear one-sided message, not nuanced. Propaganda is different than expressing an opinion or an argument. So it's going to be really explicit in trying to kind of make sure that the viewer walks away with only hearing one side and only seeing one side is credible and not giving any kind of unbiased um, view or attention to the other side of the discussion or argument. Brand is going to also be a really important term for this week as you're thinking about Miley Cyrus, but also Hollywood as a whole, because a brand is going to be a, a company, corporation, or individual that is recognizable for its individuality, innovation, or associations in manufacturing and production. The brand's effectiveness in conveying a lifestyle, quality, or degree of enjoyment associated with a good or service that it offers will help the brand to develop a sense of loyalty with consumers that consumers will continually or exclusively buy and buy into what they offer. So when we think about a brand, we can think about Disney, right, of course, as something that has kind of this humongous, gigantic reach. Um, when you think about Disney, you might already be kind of thinking about certain examples, certain messages, certain storylines or narratives, right, that are just kind of so concrete to <laughs> kind of what's permitted within the scope of Disney's, um, you know, branding of what it wants to put out to audiences, right? Much of Disney's brand is grounded in and rooted in being family friendly, but in also trying to maintain the same fans from when they're kids or babies all the way up until they are adults and really trying to have a lifelong connection with and commitment to the people that enjoy their content. Now, the franchisable tween girl is also a concept that can be helpful for this week in having reviewed all of these materials from Miley Cyrus, as it's a concept from Morgan Genevieve Blue that talks to us about the fact that, you know, the franchisable girl is going to be um, the process by which a major corporation develops the careers of young female performers and markets them to child and tween audiences to maximize the profit that can be made from them. Through her physical appearance and her labor, the female performer embodies what the corporation markets to consumers as being the ideal girl, okay? The franchisable girl who often starts her career as a child or tween will be expected to embody the standard of beauty so that she is desirable and quote unquote perfect, but must not appear threatening to the family-friendly brand of the corporation. The franchisable girl must maintain a rigorous work schedule that typically includes starring in a television show, starring in movies approved by the studio, putting out music and going on tour. Her image will be used to sell a variety of products and a lifestyle as Disney Channel franchises repurpose and reimagine their stars' names, likenesses, and performances across platforms. They attempt to franchise the girl. So all of this is to say that what Blue is getting at here is that what is at stake is that Disney is trying to make sure that, so that, that the kind of girl as a whole is their franchise, is their business, right? And so that it's that everything that this girl does, it can be monetized and can be profitable for them. And so not, it's not exclusive to, you know, a singular character or kind of one project that they work on. But the idea here is that you're kind of working the franchisable tween girl 
to become a business in and of her of her of herself, I guess is the term I'm looking for, um, to allow for Disney to make as much money for as long as possible as they can. So we see examples, of course, of kind of, you know, on Disney Channel, there's definitely a commitment to having stories about families, about having stories about girls. But when Disney Channel really gets started on Disney Channel shows in 2000, we get Even Stevens, Lizzie McGuire, and That's So Raven. And really, it's Lizzie McGuire that actually takes off even more than Even Stevens does and becomes the model through which Disney tries to brand every girl star after that point. And by that, I mean, because Hilary Duff was able to kind of translate her success on Lizzie McGuire into the Lizzie McGuire movie, and then she had a whole line of just like, you know, backpacks and clothing and lip gloss and so many different things, right? Disney tries to replicate that same success formula over and over again. And to some extent, they succeed. They have Raven Simone um, from that. So Raven, who also kind of, you know, she, of course, had her own success before this show, but she kind of also successfully makes a ton of money for them and is built out as a brand. And um, Selena Gomez is another example of this with Wizards of Waverly Place, Jemmy Lovato with Camp Rock, but probably most successfully beyond Liz McGuire is Miley Cyrus um, because she really functions as kind of their um, cash cow for a long time, right? Um, that each of these three girls at the time, now women, um, are able to kind of leverage and move their television shows into all of these other successful things, specifically music careers, you know, selling different products, um, and really becoming a standard and ideal of beauty, success, and just likability. This, of course, though, is complicated by Miley Cyrus with something we can think of as the post-Disney rebellion phase. And this is when a Disney star, typically one who has reached the highest levels of success, attempts to shed their Disney image by doing something totally different or unexpected. Bella Thorne, classic example, perhaps heir to <laughs> the Miley Cyrus post-Disney rebellion phase legacy in that her pathway um, past Disney Channel is definitely vastly different than that of her co-star from Shake It Up, Zendaya. Um, and so when we think about this post-Disney Rebellion phase, it's really going to be the transitional point, typically three to five years following um, kind of their appearances on Disney Channel, in which the individual really tries to kind of just destroy and get rid of any remaining associations with Disney that people might have in their minds. Now, NG and Risqué is going to refer to being shocking, unexpected, unusual in appearance on purpose. It pushes against the conventions of what is typically attracted um, or accepted. Attracted? Attracted is also kind of fine there, but accepted. Now, NG and Risqué could be used as either a positive or negative term. Um, sometimes people will also sort people or brands or images into edgy and risque when they don't know what to do with them. This sometimes happens with Billie Eilish's music or with Lady Gaga's performance outfits. Um, but the point here is that edgy and risque is kind of about doing things that are not conventional um, and doing them to kind of, you know, either move conversations in a different direction or to just kind of change ideas about something. Now, shock value is the potentiality of a text, person, or action to intentionally provoke or st a strong emotional reaction in the consumer, including but not limited to anger, disgust, fear, interest, confusion, and concern. Shock value is all about engagement. Keeping up with the Kardashians, the Kardashians as a whole, definitely have successfully achieved shock value as a brand. Um, Miley Cyrus at the VMAs and kind of the different outfits that she wore definitely provoked a lot of shock value, but also really Miley Cyrus is just kind of, you know, brand in that period following Disney Channel as she's promoting bangers. And then Miley Cyrus and her dead pets really relies on this shock value element. Um, the shock value element is perhaps best, you know, represented in We Can't Stop, um, as this is when Miley Cyrus debuts her short haircut, and she definitely dresses and has tattoos that, you know, change how her body is portrayed on the Disney Channel as Hannah Montana. But one of the issues with this video that's really important to kind of make note of is that Miley Cyrus definitely is, at this point in time, relying on a cultural appropriation of Black culture as her way through which she can try to signal having shock value and being edgy or risque. 
Now, one of the problems with this is not only is Miley Cyrus donning kind of hairstyles and clothing and whatnot, and like different looks that are not necessarily natural to her, and then she kind of gets the credit for them, right, as we talked about with cultural appropriation, but she's also warping and distorting some of these things by way of kind of making fun of them, um, but also kind of using them in such a way just to kind of bother people, um, and in this video, we see that she kind of really uses her proximity to Black people by way of background dancers to almost suggest like she's received per like permission from the Black community to do what she is doing. And so there's a lot of complicated conversations that arise at this point around, you know, Miley Cyrus as a white girl star is kind of manipulating her, you know, brand um, by culturally appropriating from Black folks and is doing so in such a way that she's actually, you know, succeeding even more so in her career and making more and more money than she ever had before. Um, and she definitely takes this approach um, with her stage design in terms of the bangers tour that she um, really tries to just emphasize the shock value as much as she can in terms of her kind of performance outfits, in terms of the stage design, right? In terms of the contents of her lyrics. And she's really kind of um, intertwining kind of stereotypical imaginings about Black culture into her own agenda of like wanting to separate herself from the Disney Channel. Um, perhaps most famously, of course, was also her performance with Robin Thicke, where she had the foam finger. Um, of note is the fact that the inventor of the foam finger actually went on the news and, you know, declared that the foam finger was an icon of Americanness, and that Miley Cyrus's performance really just destroyed this icon and its credibility. Um, and so it's interesting to see that at this point, that kind of <laughs> this performance was so upsetting to people that even the inventor of the foam finger um, got on TV to to criticize her performance choices here. And again, cultural appropriation, a term that we've talked about before, but just wanted to kind of include that here. Um, I also include two videos here, one from Marina Watanabe and one from Team War, both of whom provide really excellent uh, kind of discussions very briefly about kind of cultural appropriation and how it functions in society. Hey, well, oops. Hi. I apologize that it always autoplays. All right. And then just to kind of wrap things up really quickly, by 2017 to 2020, we can definitely see that Miley Cyrus takes an exit from culturally appropriating to suddenly rebranding herself into kind of this like ethereal hippie and then kind of moves into a Joan Jett-esque look to her where she's kind of moving more so into a mullet. Um, and so whereas, you know, prior to 2017, we can really see her trying to shed her Disney persona by just kind of looking as outrageous and performing as outrageously as she can to upset people who would have supported her on Disney Channel. We see her rebranding into wearing all white um, and really embracing kind of living in Malibu in 2017, and then eventually kind of transitioning to this like more femme fatale type look in 2019, um, which brings us here to where we now have her kind of in this Joan Jet goth leather-esque kind of era in her career. And all of this is kind of organized around this concept of self-branding. And self-branding is gonna be the process through which an individual controls the means of production for a project or for their own self-image, that allows them to decide how and when they appear to the public and consumers. Self-branding involves a person having some degree of power that allows them to make decisions for themselves instead of being forced to perform or look a certain way because a larger entity tells them to. At times, an individual's interests may align with a larger entity, like a corporation or brand. The process of self-branding involves an individual deciding for themselves how they wish to look, act, or perform, though this branding is never divorced from the pressures put on people by capitalism, social institutions, and structural oppression. The goal is to be visible on one's terms, or own terms, I should say. So what I'm getting at here is that with self-branding, it's this notion that the individual is getting to, to, to decide for themselves instead of a corporation telling them how exactly they're going to be presented to the public, you know, how are they going to be kind of represented in a project, what are the images and costume choices and so on and so forth that are chosen for them going to look like, right? How are they being able to be visible with visibility still a goal within capitalism, but how can they be visible in ways that are on their own terms, okay? All right, so I'm going to reappear here in this final moment. <laughs> so lecture highlight number two, 
Throughout their career, the Disney pop star's image, abilities, and labor are exploited to uphold major franchises, to maximize corporate revenue, and to provide thousands of people with jobs. The contracts that they sign, typically as teenagers, often include a morality clause that also controls how they appear to the public and often what acting roles they can take while employed by the corporation. These strict contracts and the family-friendly images of the corporation often prompts many stars to launch into what becomes known as the post-Disney rebellion phase, okay? So in closing, right, and again, unfortunately, I have to really cut out some things that we would ordinarily talk about because we just simply don't have enough time. But point here is there are a lot of pressures that are put on individual stars to perform, act, look, be, and think in certain ways. And so we want to make sure that when we're looking at various decision making and just kind of think about and reflect on why certain decisions might have been made in, term, in terms of creative choices for a music video, in terms of their you know, performance output, so on and so forth, right? What is the larger context or larger picture to use kind of some of the language from vocalizing and visualizing dissent? Um, what is the bigger picture that prompts perhaps the incentives or um, choice making that's going to really re result in, you know, potential outrageous, concerning, confusing, all over the place kind of branding, okay? So I hope that this makes sense. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me during office hours or outside of them. I know it's a lot of material. Did my best to talk quickly to get through things and hopefully you are enjoying slash finding interest in this very unique week of texts. All right, everyone, I'll see you in my third lecture and I will talk to you again soon. Bye.